uh, in another chapter of this class. And so if today it feels like we're moving through this pretty quickly, it's because we are. But just be reminded that we're going to see this again. And, and right now, again, we're trying to get that big picture view so that when we go into everything in detail, you, you, you can see the big picture because you've already, you've already seen it. You can remember the big picture might be a better way to phrase it. All right, so the four questions for today. Uh, how do cells generate energy? And again, this is one we're going to spend an entire week plus of class talking about. What are the components of the cytoskeleton? Uh, this is one we'll talk about uh, in another section of the class. What's unique to plant cells? Again, we'll spend a lot of time talking about this. And then how does the space around animal cells differ from other eukaryotes? And we'll get into that. And again, we'll see that more later on when we talk about cell communication uh, towards the end of our semester together. All right, so first question. How do cells generate energy? How do cells generate energy? Anyways, we have a reaction called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration uh, takes place partly inside the mitochondria, cell organelles, partly just inside of the cytosol of the cell, that fluid component of the cell. And so this, this Cellular respiration, it's a process, it's not a reaction. We tend to illustrate cellular respiration as this reaction here. Oh yeah, that, that'll work. C6, H12, O6, plus O2 produces carbon dioxide and water. Right, you've seen this reaction? And then we'll put, you know, we'll balance it and we tend to represent it this way, and it gives you the illusion that this is a reaction that takes place inside of our cells. This would be a horrible thing to happen inside of your cells. What is this reaction? This is a combustion reaction. This is what happens if you take sugar and you light it on fire. Okay? This does not happen inside of our cells. This instead is a summation of a process that happens in our cells, okay? This reaction does not happen in our cells. Yeah, but if you, if you burn sugar, this it absolutely happens, and it's awesome. Have you all seen the gummy bear? Oh, man, that, that gummy bear. All right, so the mitochondrion is, is a big part of this process, and the mitochondrion, and I'll show you an image of this in a minute, it's got two layers of membrane that surround it. And remember, every layer is a lipid bilayer, right? And it's got two layers surrounding it. And so this allows you to actually build up materials in between those two layers. In between those two layers. And that is a wonderful thing to be able to do. If you can pack materials into a space, what do you think those materials want to do? Do you think they want to stay in that space? No, they want to get out of that space. And as they do, they can be used to fuel other processes. Okay, so the inner membrane, remember there are two membranes. There's an inner membrane and an outer membrane. It's beautiful. Uh, inner membrane surrounds the, what's called the matrix. Okay, the, the lumen, if you will, the cavity of the mitochondrion. <laughs> And again, I'll show you an image of a mitochondrion in a minute. I'm sure you've seen one before. This inner membrane has an enormous amount of surface area. So it's, it's, it's got like 500 times the surface area of the outer membrane. That, I just, I don't think that's the actual number. I just, it's a big difference. I don't know what the actual ratio is, but it's a huge difference. And so you're packing a really, really huge membrane inside of a membrane that is nowhere near the size. And so what it forces you to do is fold that membrane up to fit it inside. And these folds are called Christi. Christa is singular, Christi, plural. Within the matrix, there's DNA, mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes and they have many other proteins that are involved in various reactions inside that inner membrane. ATP, what is that? 
the currency of the cell. Did I mention last time in class that every cell in your body makes and uses 100 pounds of ATP every day? Okay, I thought so. Um, yeah, so ATP, most of the ATP generated in your cells is generated in the Christi, in those folds of that inner mitochondrial matrix. <laughs> now, because mitochondria have their own DNA, and it is unique from the nuclear DNA, uh, many have proposed that mitochondria are began as a separate organism altogether and were phagocytized by another organism and allowed to live. Okay, We'll talk about this idea. It's called the endosymbiotic theory. We'll talk about this more when we talk in more detail about mitochondria. And then we've got another set of organelles called microbodies, uh, and these aid in metabolism uh, by breaking down molecules uh, if they are peroxisomes, or by producing sugars if they are glyoxisomes or glycosomes. And so, uh, there, in, in addition to the mitochondria, there are other organelles involved in trying to get the cell as much energy as possible. And if your cells are making and breaking 100 pounds of ATP every day, you can see the incredible energetic demands that our cells have. Right? It's a lot. Every cell in your body. And there are trillions of them making and breaking 100 pounds of ATP each day. Now I'm really curious to see how much surface area there is in the inner mitochondrial membrane compared to the outside. 500 sounds pretty good. 500 times. I, I just... That number just came to me. I, I don't think it's actually true. Okay. Are there any questions about this? I want to show you a couple of images. And again, it's going to feel today like we're moving quickly, and it's because we are, uh, but we will come back. We'll come back to all of this and spend, like, entire classes, if not entire weeks, talking through some of these concepts. Yeah, David. Where, where, where are the microbodies? Microbodies, they are spread throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. And they like... Mitochondria are, are anchored, and we'll see that in a minute. They're anchored in place by the cytoskeleton. We haven't talked about that yet, but we will in just a moment. All right, so here uh, are mitochondria. Here you've got the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and you see these folds called Christi. Incredible amount of surface area in this inner mitochondrial membrane, which when you see a lot of surface area, what does that make you think? It is, it's taking a lot of materials. There's probably a reason, a purpose for that surface area. There's probably a lot of material packed into these membranes. Okay, we'll see that in, in a couple of weeks. Here's an electron uh, micrograph of the mitochondrion. And here you can see these Christi, these folds of membrane in that inner mitochondrial membrane. Here you can see material... Uh, inside, suspended inside of the matrix that lumen, the inner cavity of the mitochondria. And what's inside there again? What are some of the things inside the matrix? Mitochondrial DNA, unique from the nucleus, mitochondrial ribosomes, and other materials, proteins, and enzymes that work inside of reactions in the mitochondria. All right? Okay. We'll do one more question, and then we'll take ourselves a lecture break. So what are the components of the cytoskeleton? We've talked a little bit about the cytoskeleton uh, already, really just in that the cytoskeleton of eukaryotic cells is far more complex than the cytoskeleton of eukary or prokaryotic cells. And so let's see what's there. So eukaryotic cells have cytoskeletons composed of these three categories of proteins. So I don't want you to see these and associate that, that that's a protein. These are categories or complexes of proteins. First, cytoskeletal element, microtubules. Microtubules. Microtubules, um, these are the dominant portion of the eukaryotic cytoskeleton. They're made from polar tubulin dimers. Uh, arranged in 13 
polymers. And so you can see as you, as you spring up here, um, as you move along this microtubule, uh, you can see these 13 strings that, that form a hollow core. What does it mean that they're polar? One end, well, they're both ends are charged, but one is negatively charged and one end is positively charged. And when you have that, that's really nice. If you've got a polar material, it means it's going to interact well with water, which forms the solvent of the cell. It also means that it's fairly easy to dissolve these structures in the presence of water as well. So you can assemble them and disassemble them fairly easily, which is nice. Yeah, Micah. Tubulin dimer is, uh, this is a protein. Tubulin is the protein. And a dimer uh, tells you that you, it requires two separate proteins together. Okay, so it's a protein with quaternary structure. And we talked about tertiary structure when it's folded correctly. Some proteins have quaternary structure requiring multiple proteins working together to actually make this work. Now, these function to anchor organelles in place. So the organelles don't just fro float freely. Remember I told you don't think about the inside of a cell as like a lake or a pond. Think of it rather as an underground factory or an underground city. And these organelles are all anchored in place by the microtubules. These also, and we'll see this in a couple of weeks, they function to separate chromosomes from each other during cell division. So if you were going to take a cell and you were going to make an exact copy of that cell, there are several things you need to do. You need to copy all of the components of the cell, right? Because you need, instead of one copy, you need two if you're going to make an identical cell from it. And then you need to separate all those materials. Microtubules function to separate all of the materials. We'll see that again in a couple of weeks. Okay, so that's one cytoskeleton type. Here's the next one, intermediate filaments. This is kind of fun. Again, the name here has meaning. If it's intermediate, it means that it's intermediate in size between microtubules and the last type, which we'll see in just a moment. Okay, so intermediate filaments, these are made of intermediate filament proteins. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What are they made of? Intermediate filament proteins. One of those is, is the most, ooh, ooh, actually I don't, I don't, it, it, either it or collagen is the most abundant protein in your body. You know what it is? In your fingernails, in your hair, the surface of your skin? Keratin. Keratin is an intermediate filament. Now these are, um, yeah, these, these cytoskeletal elements tend to provide additional support by, uh, not, I'm not, not anchoring, what's the term, reinforcing other cytoskeletal elements. And keratin in particular, we, it's beta keratin, the type of keratin that, no, it's alpha keratin, it's not beta keratin, that's what's in feathers and, uh, reptile scales. Alpha keratin, it's a really hard, rigid protein, which is why it's wonderful to build fingernails and hair uh, out of cells packed full of it. Provides structural support in most cells, again, by reinforcing other cytoskeletal elements. So the main function of the microtubule is to anchor organelles in position and then separate chromosomes during cell division. The main function of intermediate filaments is to reinforce that cytoskeleton. Keep the cell from collapsing. Bless you. Okay. And the last cytoskeletal element, microfilaments. Microfilaments. Now, microfilaments are made entirely from actin, uh, which is a protein. Actin subunits, which is also a polar protein, meaning it's going to interact well with water. You can assemble it and disassemble it fairly easily. These do a lot of things. Uh, they contract muscle cells. 
There's a motor protein that walks along actin filaments to move them in opposite directions to contract muscles. Do you know what that motor protein's called? Myosin. Uh, also involved in cytoplasmic streaming, and cytoplasmic streaming is when uh, like you're forming pseudopodia as the cell is pushing cytoplasm against the wall of, uh, against the plasma membrane in one section of the cell. Uh, also divides the cytoplasm during cell division. And we'll see that more in a couple of weeks. Are there any questions about the cytoskeleton? And what's that root cyto mean? Cell. cell, and what does skeleton mean? Cell. Skeleton, right? <laughs> so this is the skeleton of the cell. And so what's providing the bulk of it are these microtubules, but they're flexible, okay? And they're reinforced by intermediate filaments, and then the plasma membrane is supported uh, by these microfilaments, all right? I want to show you an image of these various cytoskeletal types, and then we're going to do a lecture break. All right, so here are microtubules. Here are these protein dimers that I mentioned. You got alpha tubulin and beta tubulin that in order to function have to be bound together as that dimer. And then when they are, they can string together to form this helix. Here we have a hollowed out core, okay, which provides some flexibility uh, in that um, microtubule. I think when I drew this in genetics, I don't think I had 13 of them. Oh, well. I think I had eight. What are you going to do? Can't turn back time. Oh, man, did you see the Walmart commercial during the Super Bowl? Where it's like you can pick up your groceries no matter what you drive? Nobody saw that commercial? Like, they had all these famous vehicles from various movies. Like, they had the Jeep from Jurassic Park. Bumblebee showed up. Not the good Bumblebee, but like the bug version of Bumblebee. And uh, the, the DeLorean from Back to the Future showed up. Oh, man, it was a great commercial. That was a great commercial. Sorry. You're like, I stopped watching the Super Bowl when it was three to nothing at halftime. I don't blame you. All right, so intermediate filaments. Again, these are made up of intermediate filament proteins. One of such proteins is what? Keratin. Okay, but there are a number of different intermediate filament proteins, and these, these reinforce the other cytoskeletal elements and, and provide the rigidity of, of the cell. And then here, microfilaments. There's an actin subunit, and these support the plasma membrane, provide a mechanism by which you can split the cell during cell division, which we'll see in a couple of weeks and provide a nice place for myosin, a motor protein, to walk across and pull the actin filaments in opposite directions to shorten the cell. And when you shorten a muscle cell, it shortens the muscle and moves whatever, uh, whatever structure it inserts on. Okay. It's another conversation for a different class, but I had to share. All right, so we're gonna take a little lecture break right here. Um, we, we're, we're, we'll talk about some motor proteins, but all I want you to do is this. So we've said before that the cytoskeleton of a eukaryotic cell is more complex than the cytoskeleton of a prokaryotic cell, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to draw a simple prokaryotic cell, and I want you to basically account for the functions that its cytoskeleton has to accomplish. And then hopefully you'll begin to build a picture of why the cytoskeleton of a eukaryotic cell is more complex, okay? So I want you to take about 90 seconds or so. You can work with those around you. I want you to draw a prokaryotic cell and I want you to come up with the functions that the cytoskeleton of a prokaryotic cell needs to have, all right, as you draw the cell. 90 seconds, starting now. So he said, sure, he's got a light. 
Got about 30 seconds. So All right. So, if you're going to draw a prokaryotic cell, what are you going to draw inside that cell? Well, it's still got its circular DNA chromosome, right? So it's got that circular chromosome. We call it uh, the nucleoid, right? The place in the cell where you find that circular chromosome. It has ribosomes, right? Like eukaryotic cells do. It has a membrane, okay? But you know it's lacking the membrane-bound organelles, right? It doesn't have a nucleus, doesn't have any other membrane-bound organelles. So one function that should not be on your list is to anchor the organelles in place because there aren't any except for ribosomes. Ribosomes are the only organelles, but ribosomes need to be mobile. Okay, and we'll see that in a couple of weeks why that's the case, but ribosomes need to be mobile. They do not need to be anchored in place. Okay, so that's one function we, that, that you have in eukaryotic cells with their cytoskeleton that you don't in prokaryotic cells. Okay, what's another function of our cytoskeleton that we had on the previous slide that you're not going to find in eukaryotic cells? Well, so they still have to duplicate their DNA like we do, right? If they're going to copy, if, if, if it's going to divide, it needs two copies of that DNA. But there's only one circular chromosome. There aren't 46 chromosomes like there are in our cells. So separating it is a much easier process and does not require microtubules, okay, to do it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that works. But you don't need to work as hard to separate the chromosome uh, when you're dividing that cell. Now, they still need to divide the cell, right? Yes? Yeah. And they still need to reinforce the plasma membrane so the cell doesn't collapse. Okay? Yeah? Do they take part in moving materials in and out of the cell? E out of the cell and in it, inside the cell, yes, but not really transporting around because there's no endomembrane system, right? There's no need to make vesicles and walk them along some cytoskeletal element, right? So if something gets into the cell, it'll just diffuse to where it needs to go, okay? So the, what, what cytoskeletal element anchors organelles in place and provides a roadway for vesicles to move? Microtubules. Do you expect to find microtubules in prokaryotic cells? No, and you don't, okay? Intermediate filaments are, are really great at reinforcing cells, especially in places that are subject to abrasion, like our outer layers, right? And that's why they are packed full of intermediate filaments that are really good at reinforcing cells in a place that's going to be subject to abrasion. But if you are a single-celled organism, do you get to divide labor like that and have some cells become really well-equipped for handling the abrasive uh, forces? You don't. So would you expect to find intermediate filaments in prokaryotic cells? No, and you don't. But what does actin do? Actin shortens muscles. You, you're obviously not going to find muscles in a single-celled prokaryotic organism. But it also works in cytoplasmic streaming, moving the cell and dividing the cell. Do you need to do that in prokaryotic cells? You do. And you have, some, you have something very similar to microfilaments in prokaryotic cells. That's about it that you have for their cytoskeleton. Supporting the plasma membrane, functioning to divide the cell when it needs to divide, uh, and, and functioning in, in some ways to help move the cell. Now, you do have flagella 
in prokaryotic cells and the flagella have microtubules in them, but you don't have microtubules spread out through the whole cell like you do in eukaryotic cells. Make sense? Okay, this we've mentioned already. Motor proteins move along microtubules. The two motor proteins that move along microtubules are dynians and kinesins. And then there are motor proteins that move along microfilaments, myosin. And these motor proteins, one end of them walks along the cytoskeletal element while the other end remains attached, physically attached to a vesicle or another cytoskeletal element. Uh, yeah, I, I should have an image of this. So these motor proteins allow these cytoskeletal elements to function as roadways. Okay. So here is a image of the three-dimensional shape of kinesin. So do you notice two separate colors? If you're red, green, colorblind, you, you, you might not, and I'm sorry for that. But do you notice two separate colors? Okay. There's a purple right here, and there's a pink right here. There are two separate colors. I know they're so close, but there are two separate colors here to show you that this protein is made up of two proteins. So this is another protein with quaternary structure. Okay, and so when you look at this, here this end of the protein is the walking end. You see how these look like legs? When you watch them, they, that, that portion of the protein is very mobile and remains attached. So one of them will remain attached to the microtubule, the other end will walk up to the next point, and then this part will come off and it'll literally walk along the microtubule. Every step it takes requires the hydrolysis of one ATP. And sometimes it'll take millions of steps to carry whatever its payload is to where it's going, requiring millions of ATP. Yeah? Has this been observed? Oh, yeah. We talked about it, like you have to destroy a cell. Oh, yeah, we've seen this happen. You, we, we, you can find videos of, of kinesin actually walking. Okay. Yeah. And then the other point is attached to a vesicle if it's kinesin. Um, wow, more questions on the components of the cytoskeleton. Um, so kinesin attached to microtubules and to a vesicle, okay? Or a chromosome, and we'll see that later on. Dynein is attached to a microtubule on one side and another microtubule on the next side. And we'll see that in a minute. And then myosin is attached to actin on one side and another actin on the other side, forcing the cytoskeletal elements to move in opposite directions. All right. This should be the last time we ask this question, of what are the components of the cytoskeleton? Flagella and cilia are... Um, are structures to provide locomotion in cells, and they are assembled from microtubules in a 9 plus 2 array. And so what you see, uh, I'll show you an image of this, you have nine uh, microtubule doublets surrounding two individual microtubules. Now, dyne motors, again, on one side, they're permanently attached. On the other side, they walk. And so they walk to slide adjacent microtubules in opposite directions, okay? So if you've got two microtubules that are side by side like this, and you have a motor protein that's walking this one this way, okay, what it does is it kind of bends these microtubules. That's possible because they're hollow. I told you there's flexibility there. It can bend these, and then if you bend it the other way, it creates a nice little whipping motion. And you can even spin them and propel the cell through space. Now these um, locomotion structures grow out from uh, citrioles. And we'll see this again when we talk about cell division. 
you get microtubules tend to only grow out of what are called microtubule origination centers. And the centrioles are one of those. All right, so I'll show you a couple of images of these, and then we'll be done with this question. So here is a flagellum. Here you've got the centriole down here, and then here you've got this 9 plus 2 array. You see these nine microtubule doublets on the outside, and then the two single microtubules on the inside, and then here are our dynein proteins, permanently attached to this structure, and then we'll walk along this one. Okay, and then the next doublet has some permanently attached to the other member of the doublet that will walk along the adjacent pair. Okay, and again, when they walk, it forces these microtubules to move in opposite directions and bends the structure. And then if you coordinate those motions, you can actually whip your structure or you can spin the structure. And this can propel the cell through whatever its medium is. All right. This is just showing you that bending. Again, that bending is only possible because microtubules are hollow in the middle and there's some flexibility there. If they weren't hollow, they wouldn't bend very efficiently and you couldn't actually use them for locomotion. All right. Now we made it through. We powered all the way through the second of our four questions. All right. And that's one that, bless you, we won't talk a great deal about in future classes. But this next one, we absolutely will. And the first one, we absolutely will. But this one, what's unique to plant cells? What's unique to plant cells? What are some features that plant cells are going to have that other organisms, other eukaryotes don't? Or at least not all other eukaryotes don't. Yeah, chloroplasts are going to be one. Cell wall, that central vacuole I showed you, I think, last time. Okay, which is a great repository for storing materials. Now, the chloroplasts, like mitochondria, are double membraned. Some chloroplasts even have like a triple membrane or a quadruple membrane. Also, like mitochondria, they contain their own DNA and their own machinery, ribosomes, for expressing that DNA and making chloroplast proteins. And so just like mitochondria, what do you think some would suggest about the origins of chloroplasts? Endosymbiosis. The endosymbiosis theory, that they originated as a separate living organism that was phagocytized by another cell and allowed to live, really enslaved, if you will. <laughs> Which sounds, I don't know, maybe terrible, but then it's like we kind of do that to our gut bacteria. I mean, they enjoy being there. I'm sure the chloroplast would enjoy. Anyways, this is another story. We'll talk about the challenges with that idea. Also, like mitochondria, there's an inner membrane space. And within that inner membrane, you have a, a lumen or a cavity. <laughs> now, unlike the mitochondria, chloroplasts have more membrane stacked up inside of that opening. It'd be like if you looked in the matrix of the mitochondrion and you found stacks of membrane. That's what you find inside chloroplasts. And so they have an enormous amount of surface area of that innermost membrane that forms these stacks called grana of thylakoid membrane. And the reason why is because that membrane that forms that thylakoid and those grana is just packed full of the pigments necessary to harness sunlight. There's a lot of sunlight. Gee, I forget what the percentage is. It's less than 1%, but I forget what the exact percentage is. But less than 1% of the sunlight that hits Earth's surface is actually harnessed during photosynthesis. But it's still, there's, it's such a powerful force that it, 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 plants and other photosynthetic organisms can trap enough energy to make enough sugar for themselves and for what's going to eat them and to provide energy for the entire ecosystem. A very, very powerful force. And you know this, right? You've sat out by a swimming pool for two or three hours without sunblock, and you have felt the power of sunlight. Yeah, Peyton. Um, that 
No, just in general. Like, less than 1% of all the sunlight that hits our surface is harnessed by anything. Because most of it hits a place where there aren't photosynthetic organisms. Okay. You know, like out in open ocean, there aren't a lot of photosynthetic organisms. There's plenty of sunlight, but there's not the other things that the organisms need, right? Plants need more than sunlight, yes? Right, you can't just put a plant out in a vase out in the sun and, and, and just give it that and it, it to survive, right? It also needs water, it needs nutrients. You're like, there's plenty of water in open ocean. It's complicated, it's not fresh water. <laughs> Um, and then on top of that, there are no real nutrients out in open ocean unless it's in a place where whales tend to migrate through. Because whale feces floats, and then it provides the nutrients necessary. Anyways, that's another story. That's just the cell biology. Sorry. Um, yeah, the central vacuole, mentioned that. Uh, it can account for 90% of the cell's volume be wrapped up inside of that central vacuole. It's enclosed by a membrane called the tonoplast, uh, and it stores materials, stores salts, sugars, pigments, waste, waster, what is that? Waste products, not waster products. Also functions really well for storing water, uh, contains enzymes and chemical defenses. And plants are really, really good at protecting themselves. Really good at protecting themselves. Anyways, another story for a different class. Also cell walls, many of you said this, in plant cells they are made of cellulose. Uh, and they have a soft, flexible primary cell wall and then a more rigid secondary cell wall. Secondary cell wall tends to be reinforced by lignin. And this is especially true for plants that are going to grow up a significant height because they're battling against gravity. Gravity is pulling down on their tissues and so they need something rigid enough to hold up against that, the, their own weight. And tall plants are heavy, which makes sense, right? Tall people are heavy. Sometimes short people like me are also heavy, but we're people too. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, I was watching a show, and they were making fun of kickers. It was a show. It was about football players. They were getting around. They were just, they were just talking, and um, there weren't any kickers talking. It was all mostly, like, linebackers and linemen. And somebody brought up kickers and how they're not real football players. And this, the biggest guy there grabbed him and said, listen, kickers are people, too. <laughs> That's, that's what I thought of when I said that, sorry. It's fine. They are. They are people too, but they're not football players. Anyways, all right. So plants have a special type of junction called plasmodesmata, and this is plural, the singular is plasmodesma, that connect adjacent cells together. They actually, they're like tunnels that penetrate through the cell walls to connect the cytoplasms of adjacent cells. It allows for really, really efficient communication between cells. Really efficient communication. I used this analogy before, and I think it's a good one. So I want you to imagine you've got your best friend, right? We all have a best friend. If you ask my daughter who her best friend, she'll say everyone. But she really has a best one. She doesn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then imagine, like, 30 years from now, you get a chance to live right next door to your best friend. It's just awesome. But then what would make it even more awesome is if you could build a tunnel from your house to their house, right? If you want to go over to their house for dinner, you don't need to walk out your front door, down the sidewalk, and then up to their front door. You just walk right through that tunnel, like a hotel room with the adjoining doors. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like both of them have to be unlocked and open to walk through it, so you still have some privacy. But then you've got just this nice little structure that you can just move right through. It makes for really efficient communication, right? You just kind of walk in whenever you want. Better have a good relationship with your best friend. All right, so here's chloroplast structure. Here's the double membrane. And remember, some of these chloroplasts can have a triple membrane or even a quadruple membrane. And then here are these thylakoid membrane stacks called grana inside there and just packed full of pigments for harnessing sunlight. And what, do you th what color do you think those pigments are? 
green. Mmm. It's so true. All right, and here's an electron micrograph of the chloroplast. Oh, man, here's the cell wall with the, uh, actually, it's just showing you there the cell wall and then plasma membrane wrapped on either side. Here's a plasmodesma or pleuroplasmodesmata, okay, these tunnels to connect the, uh, the cytoplasms of adjacent cells. Here you can see those plasmodesmata here connecting adjacent plant cells. Now here, you've got this, this cell wall. The secondary layer, which can be infused with lignin to really reinforce it, the more flexible cell walls. And then a protein structure to help connect the cells together. All right, we're gonna talk a lot about plants in a few weeks. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about photosynthesis. You're gonna love it. We're, we're going to talk about why do we need all that surface area. You're going to learn so much. You're going to walk away from there just really appreciating plants a whole lot more and feeling like you want to go eat some plant material just to celebrate how great plants are. All right, last question. How does the space around animal cells differ from other eukaryotes? How does the space around animal cells differ from the space around other eukaryotic cells? All right, some things that animals have that other eukaryotes do not have. One is a whole group of structures called cell adhesion molecules. Cell adhesion molecules. What does adhesion mean? Stick two things together that aren't the same thing. If you stick two things together that are the same thing, what do you use for that one? Cohesion. Okay, so adhesion, to stick two things together that aren't the same thing. And so these are glycoproteins that bind cells together in normal tissues. Animals have very complex tissues compared to other eukaryotes. And a lot of what facilitates that is keeping the cells held together so that they can communicate efficiently. Because if you're gonna have tissues you need to have the cells divide the task of the job of the tissue, right? Right? And if you're going to do that, those cells need to communicate efficiently. And if they need to communicate efficiently, they, they need to be physically attached together. Because a big way in which cells communicate is through tactile communication, being in physical contact with one another. On top of that, uh, animal cells have many cell junctions that you do not find in other cells that you do not find in other cells. For example, desmosomes. Desmosomes use intermediate filaments to, to, to essentially weld the cells together to create a permanent attachment that, that can't really be uh, what destroyed unless you rip the cells apart. We have another cell junction called adherens junctions. These use microfilaments uh, to prevent when the cells are under mechanical stress to prevent them from tearing apart. They work shin, they work shin. They work similar to desmosomes, but they use microfilaments instead of intermediate filaments. Okay? And so you find a lot of these um, in like cardiac tissue where your cardio, cardiac muscle cells are contracting on average 70 times a minute for your entire life, right? And so that's a lot of mechanical stress. And you find a lot of these adherence junctions keeping those cells held together. You find a lot of tight junctions in places where you need to build a water, uh, a water resistant surface. A water resistant, um, yeah, surface works. And so um, you, you find this in the linings of vessels, blood vessels. You find this in the lining of your intestine and other places in your gut, your digestive tract, these tight junctions, especially in the stomach. You find a lot of these tight junctions in the epithelial cells that line your stomach. Endothelial, sorry, they're still, anyways, they're, they're ep sorry, epithelial tissue, but they're on the inside, so we call them endothelial cells because you cannot get your, the contents in your stomach leaking 
out the wall of your stomach, okay? So you find a lot of these tight junctions. And these tight junctions don't just keep um, the cells protected from mechanical stress tearing them apart, but they, they basically hold the cells so tightly together that nothing can move in between them. And then gap junctions. Uh, gap junctions are analogous to plasmodesmata. They're tunnels that connect the cytoplasms of adjacent cells. Okay, and then one more thing that animal cells have that other uh, eukaryotic cells don't have is the extracellular matrix. And this is formed from a bunch of glycoproteins, which are a combination of proteins with what? With sugars. And sugars are very sticky, and she creates this sticky mesh that holds uh, cells together. It can be reinforced to form bones and uh, cartilage, cartilaginous structures, or it can be left pretty much alone and just packed full of a lot of these proteoglycans and collagen and form tendons and ligaments uh, and can also form the hypodermis and the dermis of your skin. Oh yeah, so these uh, the extracellular matrix uh, it helps to keep cells attached together, helps with the adhesion. It helps to control cell division because if cells are attached in this extracellular matrix, they won't divide. There's really no place for new cells. It also provides signals for development for the cell to change which genes it, it's expressing and then also functions to recruit materials when there is trauma and the cells need to be replaced. Yeah, Michael. Um, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think in, in skin, well, in the outermost layers of your skin, it's just a, basically single epithelial uh, layers. When you get down into the dermis, it's a lot of extracellular matrix that's holding it together and not a lot of cells. At the very bottom of your epidermis, you do have some pretty tightly packed uh, epithelial cells. And I'm guessing that they're held together mostly by one of these two rather than, than tight junctions. What makes skin so watertight, I don't think it's tight junctions. It's, it's oil, okay. right? It provides like an oil layer to prevent water from moving across it. I could be wrong, but I don't think there are a lot of tight junctions in, in your skin. And so here... Just an image uh, from the text. Actually, it's not from your text, but it's from another text, but you have access to these now, showing these different, uh, um, showing these different uh, junctions. Uh, here is a desmosome, right? These intermediate fil filaments welding these cells together. And there on the right, you can see it in an electron micrograph. Here are gap junctions. Uh, creating a tunnel by which the cytosols of adjacent cells can be connected, creating very intimate communication. And then here is the extracellular matrix, made up of a whole bunch of uh, glycoproteins, proteoglycans, which are glycoproteins that just have a lot more pr protein component. Uh, and then in this case, they are reinforced with collagen fibers. All right? Any questions? I know it may have felt like we were moving through it kind of fast, but we'll go through many of these things again in more detail, different details. So, all right. Have a wonderful conclusion to your Monday if you don't have lab today. If you do have lab, don't have a wonderful conclusion to your Monday because it is not over yet.